This one is titled Better Business. And for that, I'd like to invite onto the stage Cambridge Judge Business School Professor, Mr. Christopher Marcus. Please welcome him with a big hand. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here and learn about all the amazing innovations that the four groups put forward today. Uh, so I am a management professor, and so what I focus on is the strategies and organizational management practices companies have to take innovations deep into their companies. And so the four companies that we'll learn more about today, if they want to grow to be LG, you know, what can they do? What are the strategies, practices, processes that they can enact to take those forward in an authentic way? Because these are all companies that have a social and environmental mission at their core. And as Alex mentioned earlier, a lot of companies are greenwashing these days. And so we don't want to have, you know, sort of a vision that is sustainable, but then our practices are not. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. It's a focus of my a recent book uh, called Better Business. And I focus on these companies' B corporations, not because every company should be a B corporation. Actually, a very small number of companies will be these certified companies for their ESG performance. But the practices that have been developed are things that all companies can use. There was a recent uh, Korean version published as well. Um, so today, it's more important than ever for companies to really take responsibility for the broader social and environmental effects. <clears throat> You know, we have floods everywhere, we have inequalities, and these are some of the things, climate change, inequalities, that some of the teams are dealing with today. And so I think that actually helping scale these innovations, uh, it's really important. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why business in the traditionally is not focused so much on environmental and social issues is that they're venerally focused on their shareholders. Uh, certainly, financial shareholders, investors are crucial to businesses, but they actually sometimes get in the way of the purpose that Alex actually just talked about. And I think that he's right on target, that we don't necessarily want to focus on everyone, but actually companies knowing what the core issues that are essential to them are. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, many organizations around the world, from the World Economic Forum, actually many of our sort of colleagues may be in Davos as we speak, Right before the, the pandemic, the focus was on sustainable uh, and stakeholder capitalism. There's a group, the Business Roundtable in the US that's saying the same things. Recently was the COP27 meeting where, you know, COP being the conference of parties, bringing together business, NGOs, and government to solve the biggest problems in the world. The problem is that actually for all this talk, there's a lot of inaction. A lot of companies actually say they want to do good, but actually don't. So Marriott is a famous example. They're actually one of the companies that was part of the business roundtable saying we're going to change our purpose to be stakeholder driven. Pandemic hit. Of course, hospitality is going to have some issues uh, and not necessarily be able to continue employing everyone. But what they did is in addition to getting rid of all their employees, uh, or a huge number of them, sort of laying them off, cutting their health benefits. They also increased their dividends and gave their, sh their CEO a raise, which really, I think, sort of says where their focus is. You know, Coca-Cola also, uh, and many of the packaged good companies say, we're recycling, but actually a very small percentage of them are recycling. And I think it's really easy to sort of, you know, point at these companies and say, oh, you bad company, you know, you say you're gonna do well, but you actually don't. I think that actually a lot of the issue is that there's an implementation challenge. Actually, maybe companies do want to do well, but they don't know how to do it. And so um, the reason why is I think a lot of the norms, institutions, laws that exist really do push companies to focus on a very short-term oriented set of problems. Uh, and so all of these companies that we talked to today, you know, the four from desalinization to plastic issues to overcoming uh, issues with, with visual <clears throat> uh, imp impediments, uh, I really challenge them to really try to build an authentic company that actually is aligned with your purpose and the culture, employee practices, also grow with that purpose because, you know, there's many norms and, and uh, institutions that are pushing in the opposite direction. Yeah, so here's, uh, 
sort of this in the graph that, that a lot of times companies say they want to be more stakeholder driven, but actually are unable to do so, called out for greenwashing because of the problems with their practices. So the model uh, that I develop in the book uh, that I wrote recently to address these implementation challenges really has two dimensions. So one is, you hear about it a lot, ESG measurement, uh, ESG measurement, transparency, uh, and accountability. And I think that you know many companies say they're going to be doing all kinds of work in the ESG space. Maybe they do one or two things, but actually being publicly transparent and actually accountable to third parties is tremendously important. Uh, and the bottom one is around governance. Here too, if a company actually wants to be uh, you know, social, have a social mission, environmental mission, if actually the inside governance of the company is not aligned with that, it's actually never going to succeed in its goals. So there's a variety of governance uh, mechanisms that I'll talk about uh, in a second. So, you know, you put those two together, and that's actually where these B corporations fit in. But actually, these two dimensions are things that hundreds of thousands, probably millions of companies nowadays are actually working on as far as ESG and stakeholder governance. So here are a few B corporations that I've listed. There's, you know, many of them in Korea. You know, people frequently say this is a U.S. movement. Actually, now uh, less than 30 percent are U.S.-based. Europe and Latin America are the areas where this movement is most vibrant. I think because there's a much more stakeholder-focused uh, set of capitalist practices in the U.K. or excuse me, the, US, the EU and Latin America. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this first uh, dimension. So here's an example of Patagonia, which you're probably all familiar with. It's a company that's very, very well known for its longstanding commitment to the environment and trying to actually solve a variety of environmental problems. Uh, and this you know, ESG management uh, system that I mentioned you know, covers actually five different dimensions. You can see as you would, you know, environment, community, areas where Patagonia is really, really strong, uh, is where... Um, you know, sort of they do very well. One of the reasons why I want to show this is that actually you can see over time, Patagonia has actually improved. As I interviewed a lot of companies about implementing these ESG practices, what they said is that, you know, it's important for us to be transparent to our stakeholders, but it actually gives us a deeper understanding of our company and helps us manage better and also provides a roadmap for improvement. So you can see that with the Patagonia, they start off around 107 and are up around 151 in this ESG uh, management score. So they're getting better over time. It's an you know, internal impetus for change. And this is what um, you know, a lot of the companies uh, that I talked to said. You know, it's a way to understand your company, continuously improve. It's also a way to compare and learn. So companies can look at Patagonia, see what Patagonia's practices are because it's all very open and actually model their practices after industry leaders. So a way to share uh, um, and learn. This is very in line with what investors are saying. So you probably know Larry Fink. He's a founder and CEO of BlackRock, which I think is about $8 trillion under management right now. Uh, and over the last number of years, he has written a letter to the CEOs of the companies that he invests in, basically telling them in a variety of ways that they should be more transparent, measure ESG, be more attentive to climate, be more attentive to stakeholders. And I don't know Larry Fink, so I don't want to sort of make a comment on his motivations. My guess is that he is actually not that concerned about the social impact necessarily or environmental impact. But what he says is actually these companies have better management and actually lower risk. So these ESG management practices are a way to actually ensure the long-term risk management of the company. So uh, same, similarly with uh, the US SEC. Uh, an, an example of this is the fashion brand Chloe, um, who I've gotten to, do, uh, gotten to know the CEO, uh, Ricardo Bellini, pretty, pretty well over the last number of years. Um, I just was in Paris about a month ago uh, and talked to him. And he said, you know, we actually started, you know, he was hired in 2018 to really transform the brand into being much more sustainable, which if you think about it, a fashion brand is not really consistent with sustainability, uh, sort of cognitively. But he thought that actually through materials, through design, through workforce, um, you know, su supply chain, that Chloe could be a really 
uh, pioneering company in delivering ESG sustainability benefits. And what he said is that actually going through, starting on this path of just trying to measure and understand things like the environmental impact of materials, uh, for instance, they moved to, you know, sort of moved away from a number of, you know, cotton and others are to very high, co high environmentally damaging materials to things like linen, that are, which are much less um, environmentally damaging as an example. So he saw this as a, a, again, sort of continuous improvement process over a number of years. Uh, actually, the company got better and better over time. Uh, and actually ended up becoming one of these B corporations, but that was not their goal. Actually, they started this process just to actually learn how to implement sustainability within their company. Uh, yeah, and so this particular tool, the B Impact Assessment, uh, currently over about 250 companies, including a lot of impact investors. Many of the investment companies um, nowadays use tools like this to get a better handle on their portfolio companies. Uh, BDC and Bank of Columbia, BDC's Business, to Bank, Bank to Business Development Bank of Canada. Two examples of companies that actually use this tool to assess their lendees. Again, because it gets a good view into the company in a deep level that they wouldn't be able to get uh, otherwise. There's a lot of other tools you might be familiar with. GRI, SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. Uh, TC, TCFD, the um, science-based targets. I think there's a variety of them, and I think it's really important to think about your organization, which actually tools work best for you, stick to them, and actually continue learning uh, through your organization. Yeah, here's just a, a, a few slides on investors taking notice. So when I first started teaching on these issues of social responsibility, social innovation, uh, social entrepreneurship a number of years ago, my students would say, you know, this is great ideas for small companies, uh, but public companies, large companies, you know, maybe they're not as, would not be as focused on that. And that actually has changed over these last few years. So now all the major VC companies, uh, VC firms have sustainable uh, brands in their portfolios. I don't think this is greenwashing necessarily. I think it's because these companies actually are performing well, positioned well. You know, as of uh, recently, there's 45 of the certified B corporations in public markets around the world. Here are some examples uh, in the US. This is only in the last year or two. Again, 10 years ago when I started teaching on this, my students said this would never happen, and actually it's, it's, um, it's been happening quite, quite a bit. Large companies too, there's many companies, you know, 10, uh, 10 20, 30 billion dollar companies that are really committed to this um, also. So the second dimension, so I talked a little bit about why it is really important to be focused on measuring, being accountable and transparent on your ESG. So the second axis uh, of this model is around governance, uh, stakeholder governance. And in particular, I'm gonna highlight um, um, a legal innovation that has been spreading around the world recently called benefit corporations. So this is a type of company that actually does not have delivering profit to shareholders as the legally defined um, purpose of the company, but the company articulates a purpose. And I think very similar to what you know, Alex was saying earlier, it's important to actually know what your purpose is, to know what you sort of have in your hand. And so companies have everything from sort of serving their employees, the environment, et cetera. So it's not necessarily serving broad sets of stakeholders, but actually knowing what your corporate purpose is, and then being accountable uh, for it. So this law, this type of company, and there's tens of thousands, maybe even over 100,000 of these companies around the world, uh, started in the US, spread around uh, Europe, so Italy and France, and then a variety of places in South America. And recently, Rwanda, actually in Africa, uh, implemented this legal innovation. No countries yet in, in Asia. Maybe you all can help with uh, Korea, or Korea being the first, uh, first place. Yeah, so this is, I mean, basically what I just said, sort of, cre you know, create a material positive impact on society. So you sort of set what your purpose is, it gets encoded in the legal principles of the company, and then the purpose that you articulate outside, work in your organization, actually are well aligned with the, the governance uh, as well. And as I mentioned, being accountable and transparent too. Uh, in the UK, actually, uh, up until about a year ago, there was a lot of traction actually 
of having this type of company being the default corporation. The last year in the UK has been a very tumultuous uh, year with the poor queen passing away and a variety of other political and economic issues. Hopefully it'll get back on the agenda. Uh, but the idea being that you know, a country actually may take this innovation and have it be sort of the default uh, type of company so that companies actually have to think about, okay, what is our purpose? Maybe for some it would be actually delivering shareholder value, but maybe for others it would trigger a thinking around the broader sets of community employees and environment that are essential uh, to them. It's important actually because um, this is about empowering directors. Maybe many times managers or directors have a social mission, have a focus, want to focus on the environment, but they don't feel empowered necessarily to actually take that action. So this innovation actually helps uh, with that. Uh, I think, you know, hopefully it's somewhat obvious by now, but this is something that is really essential to culture of organizations. Uh, you read occasionally about companies that, you know, they, they have a lot of good talk and PR, but actually very destructive culture within. Sort of going through these various ESG assessments, it actually tells the company what the key practices in regards to employees are, and many there's a variety of studies uh, that have shown that sort of implementing a, you know, social responsibility practices actually helps with attraction and retention of talent, which are very uh, expensive to firms. So there's a financial benefit uh, to it as well. Uh, you know, Alex also showed the UN SDGs, and this is also a critical element of this system. So again, you know, not all 17 SDGs do companies need to focus on. Uh, there are certain SDGs that are particularly relevant to those companies, and actually this uh, system, the B Corp system, or other ESG systems like the GRI, for instance, also uh, is similar to this, helps companies understand, okay, what are the key SDGs that are essential to on my firm? And then, once those have been identified, how to actually help execute against, against improving those. So I think sort of this language of SDGs, which we can all in the world work on, is an important um, topic. Um, you know, sort of uh, finally, mainly, I want to focus on consumers. Uh, I think, you know, this is an element of the equation that I think has been underplayed. Uh, so to me, as a management professor, things like the business processes, long-term risk, um, you know, HR function, also attracting investors is another one, are really where I see some of the key benefits of being a sustainable uh, business. But also companies frequently want, okay, consumers to see what they're doing and have this have brand lift as well. And this is actually an SDG, number 12, res responsible production and consumption. I think the evidence is still a little mixed as to whether consumers actually will buy based on uh, sustainability. You know, if you look at surveys, particularly surveys of millennials, they say that they will, but I don't, I'm not sure the evidence is there necessarily yet to, to, to actually show that they, that they actually are. However, the more and more companies that are talking about this, uh, the more and more benefits the companies are seeing inside the firm, you know, it's very likely uh, that this will actually uh, pick up speed and hopefully the consumers will increasingly care about it as well. So uh, I guess in closing, what I want to say is that I see as the four finalists um, and other social entrepreneurs and enterprises, you know, want to build their business for the long term, maybe tomorrow, be the next tomorrow's LG, basically, gigantic, hugely successful company. Uh, I think that these, these ideas of ESG, management and accountability and stakeholder governments are tremendously important because, you know, consumers, People, employees are demanding more of companies nowadays, you know, the, with the climate change, inequalities, this is hugely on the agenda. Uh, and also, ESG assessment and measurement helps build better business. That's actually why I titled the book Better Business. It's because countless of the companies I talked to said, you know, I got into this idea because I wanted to be socially and environmentally responsible. But actually, going through this ESG process, I came out a better business, meaning better performing, better performing financially as well as better performing socially and environmentally. Uh, also, having the governance aligned is important as well because investors are increasingly caring about this uh, and employees 
also consumers and reputation. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Kamsa Hamnida.